Uh, my name's Don McQuillan, and in terms of the Institution of Structural Engineers, I was the 100th president. Um, dur sadly, during COVID, that was 2020 and 21. So I'm now tw two years removed from being president, if you like. In terms of my, the rest of my background, I graduated from Queen's University Belfast in 1975 with a first, and I immediately went to work for a consulting practice called KMM, Kilo Mike Mike for short. I was, the company had about 30 to 40 employees in those days, so I was part of the growth of that practice and became a partner in 1989. We grew the company to a complement of about 180 staff by the time RPS acquired us in 2004. And then more recently, RPS has been acquired by Tetra Tech. So I've been with that same company now for over 47 years and it's different guises. I've been fortunate to deliver quite a few landmark projects. At a very early stage in my career as a partner, I designed and delivered the major Belfast Concert Hall, which is known as the Belfast Waterfront Hall. And throughout my career, have delivered all sorts of st different structural types and forms, including bridges. Um, laterally, in 2000, the mid, to say from 2010, I launched the company into major healthcare work, and we successfully um, won and delivered the first major acute hospital in Northern Ireland, which at that time uh, came in at a shell cost of about 280 million sterling. So it was a, the most sizable job we'd ever delivered in that office. So then I kind of backed away from mainstream uh, engineering because I'd been there and got the T-shirt and basically done it all. And uh, I always dabbled in forensic engineering throughout those years. And I decided to try and pursue a full-time career um, and, and, and forensics and acting as an expert witness and doing insurance-based work. So that has taken most of my time since. In fact, I very quickly ramped up to 100% utilization doing that for the company. Um, I managed before the pandemic to hand over the running of the structures team to my junior co-director. I sort of jokingly say that all I do now is sit and maximize profit for the team. So <laughs> one of the one of the major cases which was so fulfilling during the past few years was I managed to get appointed as expert engineer to a commission of inquiry in Hong Kong. So I was actually appointed by the commission's legal team working for the commission, which was you know quasi government and that the commission was really reporting to the Department of Justice in Hong Kong. Uh, and that was very rewarding. I, I was involved from mid 2018, right through to giving my final evidence. There were three hearings. I gave my final evidence at the start of January 2020. And the, the uh, government in Hong Kong published, the commission and the government published that report in mid uh, 2020. So that was a, a rich experience, involved a huge amount of travel, um, but very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Forensic engineering is so, the, the basic questions I ask myself as a forensic engineer, what went wrong, right? So what what damage was caused and held, hence loss? So damage and financial loss go together. Then the third question is, how do you fix it? That could involve remedial work or it could, be, it could involve complete demolition restructuring. And the final question that comes into play is, who was responsible? Yes. <laughs> what are some of the unique things or similarities that you've seen through that career in forensics? So when I was president, I gave a series of presentations um, majoring on the recurring themes that I've come across from doing that type of work and trying to get across to other engineers the lessons learned. And that started in my own company because my fellow directors wanted to know what I was doing because they didn't understand it and why it was making so much money. Yeah. So they, they, they organized at a particular, a special director's meeting when I gave them a presentation. And when they saw the lessons that I was trying to teach others and learn from others' mistakes, they immediately rolled this out to the whole company. So over a series of three or four lunch times, all the staff in their various peer groups, including all the admin team, they came in and had a sandwich and a cup of coffee. And, I gave them this presentation. It was considered that considered essential that everyone from the proverbial tea boy upwards knew that New things boy. can go wrong yes. and how to avoid them going wrong. So in terms of the recurring themes, uh, I think one of the very important lessons that um, 
creep into a lot of these cases that go wrong is the brief, the initial appointment is not written uh, in language that sort of is clear cut. So if there's any ambiguity in the appointment, that can lead to problems down the line. Um, another, another theme that used to commonly occur, maybe not so much nowadays, uh, in the United Kingdom, we call them the CDM regulations, all to do with health and safety during the design and also the construction pro process. So when those were first introduced, a lot of cases, um, a lot of, there were a lot of defects crept into design work simply arising from a lack of knowledge of health and safety and, and the buildability of what an engineer is actually designing on paper. So those are some of the things. There are other common things like foundations, um, not, not understanding piling, for example, driven piles in certain conditions can induce negative skin friction and this drag so down. <clears throat> the whole issue of load transfer platforms on piled foundations have created huge issues. Another one that maybe not so significant in terms of um, engineering expertise, but I come across a lot of failures of what I call system retaining walls. So particularly uh, retained earth walls where the front face consists of a modular system of blocks interwoven at various heights with geotextile layers and the, the backfill is kind of upfilled in that process. So the, the earth depends upon the wall to retain it and the wall depends upon the earth. So it's like a homogenous situation. So there are a lot of failures in those and that comes down to the fact that the walls are, are designed in an office. The chap who designs them doesn't go out to visit site. And sometimes the site, the, the ground, the soil conditions in terms of their bearing capacity are not found on site to what the designer assumed them to be. Yes. But there's no one there to identify that. And, and on other occasions, failure has occurred because the contractor on site working on supervised has simply rolled out the big roll of geogrid and placed it in the wrong direction, in the weak direction, uh, because it's rectangular. So and it's, it's instead, instead of cutting it and placing the tails the correct length in the strong direction, they simply roll it out and don't cut it, and it makes life easy for them. Yes. So <laughs> those are some of the common problems and a host more. It's not for everybody. That's a kind of a misnomer. And many of my colleagues who are technically excellent as well as in other companies, shrink from it, shirk away from it. I think what puts them off is the feeling that they're critiquing their peers when something goes wrong. More importantly, many of them have a fear of ever going into the witness box and giving evidence and then be cross-examined. To me, that's not a problem because I always make the point that an expert witness work, your, the duty is solely to the court, not your client. Yes. It doesn't matter who pays you. And Provided you are impartial and independent, you can never go wrong under cross-examination. It's when you try to play advocate for one party or try to bend the truth or step outside your sphere of expertise, yes. that's when things go wrong. So it's all about yeah, sticking to the truth. And, and if, you, yeah. if it is something you're not used to, yeah. you're saying, well, sorry. Uh, and the other thing, I, I'm, I've been a visiting professor at Queen's University now. For, I think this is my sixth year. So I, I, I got embedded into the 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 course the final year course a lecture on forensic engineering so i go in and make that interactive with the students just to let them know that things can go wrong um when they come out of university and uh, that has been very very beneficial to them as well and it's probably something that i think as engineers we don't do quite well it's obviously changing now with cross but something yeah. we don't talk a lot about those yeah. failures or how we can address them yeah that and some of those students will all where well, they always ask the question at the end of the course oh right what degree do I need to become a forensic engineer? <laughs> what training? We'd, we'd like, I'd like to go into that straight away. And I'm saying, well, look, um, look at the color of my hair and the number of years I've been practicing. That's what it takes to become a good forensic yeah, but, engineer. But you need to have that knowledge of design, construction, have that broader experience to be able to see yeah, what was it. Exactly. Um, so before someone steps into forensic engineering, what would you recommend them try to make sure it is for them? If they think they have the requisite experience and they like the mental challenge, um, and it does involve sometimes meeting deadlines and working long hours to serve a report at the requisite time. Uh, the best thing nowadays is to become accredited. 
And that is a bit of a chicken and egg process because, and, and I am accredited, for example, with the Academy of Experts in the UK, and they run foundation training courses. They also run simulating a day in court and being cross-examined with real barristers. So um, it's chicken and egg in the sense that you can go and do that foundation course, but until you actually have produced at least three reports, you can't apply to become a member because they will ask for a copy of your last three reports and they will take references from the instructing solicitors that you've been working with in those cases. So a bit chicken and egg, but it used to be that anybody could step in and practice as an expert witness. And a lot of engineers didn't understand the rules of engagement and who their duty was towards. And so they were getting taken up by their institutions for professional misconduct and so forth. So it's all about nowadays, the judges insist that the expert must be accredited. I think you've mentioned cross, I think. And what, what we do in our office is circulate every cross report to every member of our structures and civils team. Because even though you're at that, they're at that stage in their career where they're learning how to design buildings, they need to be aware of the potential dangers. And those cross reports are pretty wide in their scope uh, as to what can go wrong with projects and materials and methodologies. And so I think it's vitally important that younger engineers keep their eyes open as to the pitfalls and the bear traps and try to avoid them. What recommendations would you have when an engineer has realized he's made a mistake in his design? First thing is come clean on it. If you've realized you've made a mistake yourself, go to your line manager and just, you know, don't try to brush it out or deny it because there's always a solution to the problem. And as you say, it's better fixing it, the mistake before it gets to site. Um, having said that, um, I would encourage all younger engineers, even though they may not understand the significance, to ensure that their work is signed off by their line manager. So any, any major or even semi-major design consultancy should have all the uh, quality assurance uh, procedures in place and policies in place to ensure that every piece of work is checked. Yes. And uh, I wouldn't recommend, I know it's difficult for if a young engineer joins like a firm with only one or two people, but even then they're always reporting to someone above them. And it's important to have those calculation sheets ticked off as checked and the drawings. You shouldn't be relying on them to make sure you've done it right. Correct, correct, absolutely. And the other thing, because I do a lot of professional reviews for different institutions, I'm, it's one of my favorite questions when candidates are applying to become a chartered engineer and they, Nowadays, there's this huge reliance, whether it's in civil engineering or structural engineering and software packages. And I say to them, okay, so you're supposing you're designing a, a drainage network and you come in in the morning and your, your laptop your, doesn't start up or your software is corrupted or something, yeah. so, something prevents you from doing it uh, by, on the computer. Explain to me how you do it by first principles. <laughs> or if they've presented me with this fabulous bit of design that's come out of a, a software package, I'll say, tell me how you validate that very quickly in 10 minutes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and that's so, so important to so do. Important. Yeah, because you don't know whether it's very easy to short circuit that. Yeah. Because you can put garbage into a computer and you Correct. just get garbage out. That's right. Okay, thank you, Brandon. <laughs> nice to have met you nice, too. Nice to have met you.